Counting to God, Part 13. We've been discussing the book, Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief, by Attitude, uh, pardon me, published by Attitude Media, written by Douglas L. in 2014. It is available on the net, and um, uh, there's the cover. It is also available in hard copy. We've uh, actually had a copy of that here. Um, and we're into actually, oh, I should have that. It's part three, Conclusions, and chapter 15, The Logic of Belief. And he asked the question, what's the argument here? And as usual, uh, he puts down a, uh, a pithy aphorism that he, uh, that he sees as summarizing what's going on. Uh, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Of course, a quote from Sherlock Holmes. And he begins his chapter by saying, I have given you seven wonders, seven pillars of scientific support for the existence of God. Let's look at the underlying logic. How exactly does science support belief? What are the basic arguments here, and what are the counterarguments? Many atheists, and even some theologians, will suggest, I am arguing from ignorance. They will suggest that most or even all of the wonders of this book, all of the incredible scientific evidence for the existence of God, are but gaps in our present knowledge. They will suggest that just because we don't currently know how something could have been created from nothing doesn't mean God did it. That just because we don't currently know how life formed doesn't mean that God did it, and so on. They will suggest I have fallen into a God of the gaps fallacy. It's a little insulting. It's like saying, you're ignorant. Don't you know we will ultimately figure everything out with no need for God? Why can't you get with the modern world? It's a fallacy. You're ignorant. And if you think that any observation, experiment, or reasoning could provide support for the existence of God, don't you know God is a mere superstition? It surprises me how successful this God of the gaps objection has often been in shutting down debate on design and the existence of God. I have come across respected scientists who, although they believe in God, somehow think this objection requires them to disown evidence of God. It's a tricky objection because it assumes its own correctness. It assumes that scientists, science will ultimately provide a complete non-theistic explanation for all things. It assumes belief in science of the gaps. As I've said before, you can choose to believe in science of the gaps, or you can believe that the wonders described in this book are evidence of the existence of God. Your choice. Some theologians have bought into this God of the gaps objection, uh, perhaps because they do not want to paint God into a corner, where every scientific advance reduces belief. Here's German theologian and martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer. How wrong it is to use God as a stopgap for the incompleteness of our knowledge. If, in fact, the frontiers of knowledge are being pushed further and further back, and that is bound to be the case, then God is being pushed back with him and is therefore continually in retreat. We are to find God in what we know, not in what we don't know. I agree with Bonhoeffer that we are to find God in what we know, not what we don't know. That is exactly why I find the stunning results of modern science so compelling. We know only that we know that only intelligence produces information, and we have now found information in the universe and in life. If Bonhoeffer were alive today, I believe he would agree that we can know God through science. This God of the gaps objections assumes that as our scientific knowledge grows, the seven wonders of this book are shrinking. I strongly disagree. I think the contrary is true. Molecular biology, for example, continues to reveal technology and design within life. And just this week, there's uh, another whole field uh, that, come out, that came out on circular RNA and circular DNA in eukaryotes. A lot has happened since Bonhoeffer wrote those words in a Nazi prison in 1944. This God of the gaps of objection assumes that as our scientific knowledge grows, the seven wonders of this book are shrinking. 
I strongly disagree. I think the contrary is true. I, you know, I think that I have a double. Each of the seven wonders of this book is based largely or totally on scientific facts and theories after World War II. The discoveries, one, that our universe was created, two, of the fine-tuning of our universe, three, of the impossibility of creating life by chance, four, of DNA and the technology of life, five, of the myriad puzzles of macroevolution, six, that the Earth is special, and seven, of quantum physics and the non-material foundation of the universe. We may no longer see God in the rising of the sun each morning as many ancient civilizations did, now we see God in the creation of the universe and the resonance levels of carbon atoms. Instinctive awe over the wonders of life has been replaced by knowing that all living creatures run off the same operating system and are built using a tremendous amount of information. Billions of monkeys typing for the entire life of the universe cannot rationally be expected to produce more than a short snippet of Shakespeare or functional DNA code. I do not claim all the gaps in our present scientific knowledge are evidence of the existence of God. I chose the seven wonders of this book carefully based on what we know. For example, Proposition 1, we know from all human history and all of science that only intelligence is capable of producing information. Proposition 2, we know from multiple scientific discoveries in the last few decades that there is a tremendous amount of information hidden in the structure of the universe and in all living creatures. Conclusion, the universe and life were designed. This reasoning is focused and direct. It's a positive argument based on finding in nature the type of information and complexity that, in all human experience, comes only from intelligence. To me, design is the only plausible explanation for the creation of the functional nanotechnology in all cells and the stupendous creation of human beings and the human brain. Yes? You can choose to believe in cumulative selection, but I find that, that an illogical fairy tale that collapses upon even cursory examination. We know so much more from science, observation and experiment and reasoning that points to God. We know our universe was created from Hubble's law about the movements of galaxies away from us, from the 1965 discovery of actual relic photons from the Big Bang, and from other evidence. A fundamental premise of science is that everything that comes into existence has a cause. What we know points directly to the existence of a supreme creator outside of space and time, to a first cause. It does not conclusively prove that God exists, but it certainly suggests that it is a viable possibility, perhaps even the best conclusion, and one has to personally decide whether the alternative belief in an infinite multiverse with its serious mathematical difficulties, that just exists for no reason, is more plausible. The multiverse is pure science fiction. There is no scientific evidence that it exists, and there likely never will be any scientific evidence that it exists. We know our universe is fantastically fine-tuned for life. The laws of physics and dozens of constants of physics have been set unbelievably fantastically just right. This is information hidden in the structure of the universe, and it points to the existence of God. The alternative is to believe both in an infinite multiverse that just exists for no reason and that the laws and constants of physics can change. There's no scientific evidence that the laws and constants of physics can change, at least certain of them. We know that all life is incredibly complex. At this time, there is no even mildly plausible theory for the origin of life by undirected natural means, and there is no expectation of any new law of chemistry or physics to explain the origin of life. There is information hidden in the structure of all life, designed in fantastically complex assemblies of atoms and molecules, and it points to the existence of God. There is no atheist explanation for the origin of life. We know the technology of life is billions of years old and more advanced in many ways than human programming and technology. This points to the existence of God. The atheist belief that new functional nanotechnology arises from random combinations of atoms or even existing life has no mathematical clothes. We know that there are unanswered puzzles in the emergence of wholly new species. To name just one, we now know that all creatures have designer or orphan genes 
with no apparent relation to genes in other forms of life, and that those genes often help make that creature unique. To be sure, Darwinists will fight to the death on this issue and speak rapturously of the power of natural selection. But cumulative selection is a fairy tale, and the fossil record and other facts of science do not agree with neo-Darwinian theory. We know Earth is special. Exactly how special remains to be determined, but right now, it looks very special. We know from quantum physics that there are connections outside of space and time. We know that number, fantastically complex mathematical concepts and ideas, underlies all of physics and may be the foundation of existence. These known facts point to God. As what we know increases, as the evidence grows, I think we have reasonably eliminated any pretense that materialistic views of reality are complete. What is left, as improbable as it may seem to some, is the existence of a transcending intelligence outside of space and time. A second counter-argument to the wonders of this book is saying that God did it has no explanatory or predictive value. Notice that this argument again assumes scientism, or at least a close cousin to scientism. It assumes that only theories with explanatory or predictive values are worthwhile, that science in some narrow sense is everything, and that all focus should be on theories that can predict. One response to this is that intelligent design does predict we will continue to find evidence of God in the design of living creatures, and that prediction is being confirmed in laboratories around the world almost every day, such as the announcement in September 2012 by 450 scientists worldwide working on the ENCODE project that at least 80% of the human DNA serves some function, driving a stake through the heart of the myth of junk DNA. A more direct response is that I'm not trying to predict. I seek meaning beyond prediction. I seek answers to the great questions. The great questions, such as why the universe exists and whether there is some type of greater reality and greater truth, are beyond science. Now, before I turn to the first part of chapter 16, I'm going to just summarize my own take. Um, I mostly do agree with Douglas L. here. I would just add that God to the God of the gaps argument that is basically called a surrender. What its proponents are really arguing is that there can be no evidence for God. All the gaps will eventually disappear, so why don't you just give up now? That's fine if it is true, but some of those gaps are getting larger rather than smaller. And I specifically picked the origin of life where it was thought to be simple back in Darwin's day. Found out not to be so simple and as time goes on, getting harder and harder and harder. It really doesn't look at this point like, they, like those particular gaps and that one in particular is going to disappear. I thought skepticism about a theory's effectiveness, such as that the origin of life is materialistic, was a good thing in science. Apparently not. And I think that uh, L's science of the gaps is a good retort in this regard. I also think that unguided evolution can be a science stopper. Why well, look for function in all of that DNA? It doesn't have any function anyway. That's Dan Grauer's reaction to the ENCODE papers. If evolution is right, then ENCODE is wrong. So ENCODE must be wrong because everybody knows evolution is right. Stop an entire project because it violates evolutionary theory. Before that, see the ignominious history of the vestigial organ argument. Oh, it doesn't do anything. Says who? In fact, it's worse than just wrong. It's actually deadly. People were actually caused to die because the spleen was considered vestigial. Got a problem with the spleen, just take it out before it gives you, before it bleeds. Which sounds wonderful until you realize that you are putting, making those people vulnerable to pneumococcal infection, among other things. So what other organs? Uh, Neisseria, meningitis, Neisseria, gonorrhea, uh, can spread like wildfire through somebody who doesn't have a spleen. The spleen is the major organ for filtering that. What else, what else is considered vestigial? Um, 
Well, the appendix is one. The tonsils were another. I don't know if uh, back in my day, everybody had their tonsils out. Except for us kids, I still have mine in. And that's in spite of the fact that I had a sore throat or two. Uh, my dad was a surgeon. He could have taken them out easily. How about the thymus? The what? The thymus. The thymus, yes. Well, the, the thing of it is, I, very few people had their thymuses removed. Uh, in infancy, even though it was considered vestigial simply because uh, it was a difficult operation and why bother? But the tonsils were taken out all the time. I think the coccyx also. Yes, well, people didn't actually take out the coccyx, but t people took out the spleen all the time. And that's one that people actually died because they had the spleen out. Well, they died 20 years later, but they still died. And as far as that goes, there may not be much research stimulated by intelligent design, but there certainly is some. And creationism, which is a kind of branch of intelligent design, if you want to put it that way, has stimulated research ranging from the Yellowstone Fossil Forest to the Coconino Standstone to Hermit Shale Cracks to Carbon-14 in Coal and Dinosaurs and is now stimulating Y-chromosome research. So the idea that intelligent design cannot stimulate research is just bunk. And now we're going to come to part two, conclusions chapter. That's actually part three. I missed that. Um, Chapter 16, Connecting the Dots. And the question he asks is, how does it all add up? And I'm going to just give you the two uh, uh, first-liners there. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars, lay aside immaturity, and live and walk in the way of insight. And then one from Albert Einstein, there are only two ways to live your life. One is, though, one is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as if everything is. And he starts out by saying, we've journeyed through seven wonders of modern science. In physics, we, meet, we meaning the collective wisdom of the entire human race, over the last 100 years have learned that our universe was created, our universe is fine-tuned for life, and our Earth is special. In biology, we have learned that even the simplest, most primitive life contains a staggering amount of information, and the origin of life requires the creation of hundreds of specialized proteins, including proteins to read and process DNA, and the simultaneous creation of the exact DNA code for the construction of these proteins. We have learned there is no evidence that the operating system of life, the central dogma of molecular biology, has evolved or changed in billions of years. We have learned the fossil record is devoid of the myriad transitional forms predicted by Charles Darwin, and that the puzzles of macroevolution, the sudden emergence of wholly new species, cannot be explained by natural selection alone. We have learned that number, which I use to include fantastically complicated mathematical concepts, is not only our tool to understand the universe, it may be the foundation of the universe. I do not mean to limit God to seven wonders. Some think it is a wonder the universe is capable of being understood, at least in part, by human beings. Others think it is a wonder that the universe seems to be designed to allow us to learn about it. In many ways, the wonder of the universe seems unlimited in the smile of a child, the colors of the fish in the sea, the sound of a Mozart concerto, the seven wonders are a good fit with Abrahamic faith. When the book of Genesis came into final form, perhaps 2,600 years ago, it claimed the universe was created. The universe was made for life. Earth is special and life was created. Each claim is supported by modern science. Genesis begins with a good summary of how it all took place. The actual Hebrew word in Genesis 1 is yom, and one of its meanings is an indefinite period of time. We're going to come back to that. The Bible breaks down the creation of the universe and the earth and life into seven yomes to give ordinary people, including uneducated people, 2,000 persons, 2,600 years ago, a general sense of the awe of creation. I see broad general consistency between modern science and the faiths of Abraham. There is room for wonder, awe, astonishment, surprise, and admiration, and for hope. To be sure, one can choose to believe that the universe is pointless and that everything in it, including Earth and all life and human beings, exists because of accidental, meaningless events. 
You can believe there are an infinite number of universes with different laws, features, and constants of physics. These are beliefs. They are not required by modern science. I think they are not consistent with the latest discoveries of science, with the proven facts of science, with the evidence of God. I think the paradigm of a pointless universe so fervently embraced by popular media and by the atheist mindset of many Western intellectuals shockingly devoid of scientific grounding. grounding. To me, the facts favor Abrahamic faith belief in a creator God. I agree with John Mark Reynolds, who incidentally, for those of you who may not know, is actually a short age creationist. To use a science to promote atheism, to use science to promote atheism, is like using a man's child to prove he does not exist. To me, the belief that we are here by accident is a superstition, and the claim that science supports it is the greatest fraud ever perpetuated on the human race. Pretty strong stuff there. We have put the great question about the existence of God to the test of science, and we have come to a place of wonder and mystery. Here's Robert Jastrow. Some of you may remember this quote. It reappears all the time. For the scientist who live, has lived by faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak as he pulls himself over the final rock. He is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. What does science tell us of the creator? First, that there is a creator. By itself, this is deism. Deism is the belief that God created the universe for life, but plays no further role. In the first cause, in the act of creation, and then the fine-tuning of the universe to make life possible, we have scientific evidence supporting a switch from atheism to, at least, deism. There is something outside of our reality. To me, this is an inescapable fact of the Big Bang. You can call it God, or you can imagine some blind universe creating mechanism, but there is something beyond our reality, something outside of space and time. Deism is also supported by the fine-tuning of the universe. All agree that our universe is, or at least strongly appears to be, designed for life. I think modern science takes us further, giving us strong evidence that our creator God has not abandoned us and is still present. About 4.4 billion years ago, our special Earth-Moon system was formed. About 3.5 billion years ago, or perhaps even earlier, at or near the end of the late heavy bombardment, largely a deluge of comets that may have left the Earth with just the right amount of water, life was created. We'll come back to that. As we have seen, the simultaneous creation of the necessary machines of even the simplest forms of life, together with the exact DNA code to build these same machines, is far beyond the reach of chance. Life may have formed in some primeval pond, but mere chance cannot be the explanation. The puzzles of macroevolution, from the creation of dozens of radically new body structures and systems in the Cambrian explosion beginning 541 million years ago, to the creation of modern human beings, perhaps just over 100,000 years ago, our scientific evidence, God is with us today. If you can somehow forget the battles over the evolution of human beings and look at it with fresh eyes, the evidence is overwhelming that all of the anatomical changes and intellectual capacities of human beings could not have arisen slow, solely from blind mutations and natural selection. Humans were created according to him. I believe natural selection was part of the process, but it was guided by God, perhaps at the quantum level. We were built by a master designer. Where else did those designer genes come from to make us human? I see design in all creatures. How did the leaf cutter ant get 9,361 unique proteins? I'd like to conclude with some personal beliefs. This is what I believe in beyond science. We're only going to get partway through this. Beyond reproducible observation, experimentation, and logic. This is my innermost core of belief. And before I so share, I want to emphasize that I respect all religions, all persons on the belief side of the great debate, all persons who believe in a greater reality. I believe there are many paths up the mountain. I believe in a personal God, a God who is with us, that is with us today. To me, the scientific evidence that an intelligence outside our reality designed the universe, designed life, and guided evolution through the aeons up to the creation of modern human beings is compelling. I believe such a God would not abandon us. 
Now, my take on that last little bit is I obviously disagree with Douglas L. on several questions. The Genesis story was written closer to 3,500 years ago than 2,600 years ago. Although, even 2,600 years ago is interesting because it dates the priestly code to pre-exilic times, which was not traditional. So, even so, the documentary hypothesis of the Pentateuch, at least in its traditional form, has fallen by the wayside. I think that the translation of an indefinite period of time for Yom is much more problematic than he assumes. So does that imply that he doesn't really believe in a creation week? I, well, his, I think his week is seven per indefinite periods, if I understood how he ex explained it previously. But um, I, I disagree with the scientific time frame that it hasn't been three billion years, that it's been more like 6,000 years uh, since, the, uh, uh, since the origin of life and since the moon was put in place. But I would still defend L in three ways in that particular, uh, with those particular things that I disagree with him first. I think this is the natural first position to take for one coming out of atheist materialism. You cannot expect people to correct all of their ideas all at once. Maybe if you're lucky it happens. It happened apparently with uh, Dean Kenyon and it apparently happened with uh, uh, John Sanford. But much of the time people get stuck in an intermediate position. Even Henry Morris of uh, Institute for Creation Research fame got stuck in that position for a while. Secondly, he gives evidence of being open to creationism. I emailed him and he said that uh, creation, the short age creations have some uh, powerful arguments that he hadn't con considered before. So where he was in 2014 is not necessarily where he is today or where he will be in another five, ten years. So I think that you need to give him time. And last, I think rejecting materialist scientific claims in one area, such as we can account for everything, makes it easier to reject them in other areas. And so I see it being almost natural, um, as natural as what we humans do, for him to be able to move further as he has more chance to think about it. Um, but besides the aspect of science pointing to God with which I agree with him wholeheartedly, there is one other place where I would agree with Douglas L. in this particular case. And that is I believe that in a sense he is right when he says that there are many roads to God. Now. I would phrase it a little differently. I would say that God accepts theological error in his children to a much greater extent than we usually assume. That is, there is one road to God. But people take all kinds of interesting detours and God still accepts them. And let me defend that. The thesis that knowing Jesus as your personal savior is mandatory to enter the kingdom can be disproven biblically. Enoch walked with God and was taken to heaven and there is no indication that the name Jesus meant anything to him. Certainly it was not left for his descendants to know. Same with Elijah. No record of... Um, him even really being that conscious of coming Messiah. In fact, taking it to its logical conclusion, Jesus as your personal savior being necessary would exclude anyone before the time of Jesus from any chance at salvation. And Jesus told the story about Abraham's bosom, assuming that Abraham would be there. We haven't wrestled enough with this problem, partly because wrestling with this problem 
might make us heretics in the views of some who want to make Christianity into a cult, in my opinion. But it is worse than that for the theory. The theory condemns anyone who lived after the death of Je and resurrection of Jesus to being lost unless that person has heard about Jesus. I have frankly have difficulty with the concept that Bereans who died before Paul had come and preached Jesus as the Messiah were destined to be lost. And finally, in one of the only two places in the New Testament where Jesus uses the verb dikaiao, you know, the one that everybody says, oh, justification, what does it mean? Is it justification, is it righteousness, whatever? The publican is said to have been justified or made righteous. This man went down to his home justified. Look it up. It's the Greek verb dikaiao. The publican simply said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. No word was offered about the coming Messiah who presumably witnessed the prayer. What appears to be required from Jesus' own mouth is that one acknowledges one's sinfulness and calls upon God to help. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Those, not coincidentally, are the first two steps of the 12-step program. We acknowledge that we were powerless, right? We acknowledge, we ask for the help of a higher power. That's the publican's prayer. I will quote Acts 17, 26, and 27. This is Paul speaking on Mars Hill. And it's made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. He's talking about all of humanity. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. Is it really possible that those people could find the Lord? Was Paul wrong on that? <coughs> though, he not, might not, though he be not far from every one of us. That sounds like Paul is leaving open the possibility that people like, well, I don't know, Euripides, uh, uh, the, the poet that he quoted, Euripides, I believe it is, but... Uh, might possibly wind up in the kingdom, doesn't it? It sounds like Paul is leaving open the possibility that pagans can actually find God or at least be able to recognize it when God finds them. And Jesus is famous for saying, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Notice he has them present tense but they are not in the upper room with the disciples. Presumably meaning that there are people out there who are, if you want to be technical, theologically saved. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. But there isn't now but they are still my sheep you can if you want to try to turn that into well those are the ones that God knows will respond and so he's just waiting to get them and they have to know Jesus as their personal savior I don't get that from this verse it sounds to me like what God wants is what the publican did. Now I'm willing to leave the final judgment to God, but I would not be surprised to find not just Protestant Catholics and Orthodox <laughs> Christians, but Jews, Muslims, and even Zoroastrians, Taoists, and Shintoists in the kingdom. Um, we have a comment, can you? Hand? Yes. Just uh, before you veer off of this thought, 
there's a remarkable text in the Bible, I forget what it is. It says, what is those marks in your hands? Folk who are already in heaven, they don't know what these marks are in his hands. Somewhere mm -hmm. in, in the Bible. Well, so these folk even don't know who he is and what he did in the world. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something. It's really easy to make this case with Ellen White. Yeah. Really easy. I'm making it from the Bible because there are people for whom the Bible is authoritative and Ellen White is not. But I want to point out that it's in the Bible as well. I think there is a reason why missionary experience the world over tells them that the best pagans make the best Christians. It's because they're already saved and all you're doing is relieving their mind and, and turning them loose, so to speak. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. So on this multiverse thing, this is my response, so see if you can come up with a counter argument on it. But if there truly is an infinite number possibilities of, of different universes then there's one that includes a god and creation hush your mouth <laughs> i mean so you have to at least allow the possibility right if there's an infinite infinite number of universes so that would be my no, response to that. i know i know you see and the only instant reply would be uh no we can allow any any uh any universe but that. Well, see, so and I think it, it brings out what's really going on here. This is not a scientific argument. This is a theological yeah. argument. They don't want there to be a God. Once you realize that, then you realize that they may be twisting the whole thing. And the other one, I, um, I thought I read that uh, in Spirit of Prophecy that there, Jesus would have this group of people that never heard his name that he would personally escort and educate. But I couldn't find it again when I tried to do a search in the database. So if anybody knows, remembers where that is, I'd be interested in rediscovering it. Do, does that, yeah, is, did, have you way, read that or has other people read that or am I just making it up? By the way, Ellen White is, I think, commenting on, I believe it's Zechariah where it talks about what are these marks in your hands and these are the marks that uh, were given to me in the house of my friends. Uh, am I misquoting that badly? Zachariah. If you, if you have a, a quick concordance, the lazy man's way of looking it up is uh, house of my friends in the King James and I think you'll be able to find it. The, uh, the, the Ellen G. White quote is from Desire of Ages. She uses the precise wording that there are some who have never heard the name Jesus on anyone else's lips, but in carrying out his compassionate ministry to others, they, w they are part of his sheep of his fold. It might be in the discussion of other sheep, other sheep I have of my fold. He took them down, he took them, he had the yes, group that he took, I don't, I don't think I, I That one, no, that doesn't go into eschatology and, and, you know, leading them by the hand into heaven, but that's well, so like probably something else. Something I comment behind you. <coughs> I wonder if maybe you would be willing to add it to one of the latter slides where you have the list of different uh, uh, religions to include also some atheists because I have met and worked with and known some wonderful atheists who who I felt closer to in many ways than I did with some Adventists. Uh, it would depend on why you were an atheist and what you were doing with it. Well, isn't that true about every one of them? Uh, yes, it, yes, it, it does. Uh, I mean, sometimes 
There are, there are atheists who were raised that way. In the old Soviet Union where religion was just absolutely forbidden. Well, if you are faithful to the truth that you see and are open to truth that you can find, that's the best you can expect from anybody. Well, I think there's one other, th there's one other part to it, but I would agree with you in principle. I, I think that one of the things that you have to be open to is love as well as truth. Oh, yes, yes. But, but yes, I think that people who are, who, people who have never heard except in bizarrely distorted ways, um, the truth about Jesus, um, then uh, may, may still be eligible for the kingdom. The, the thing you have to do is to realize that you need to repent and you have to call on God to help. Well, it may not be God, but it may be the, the closest thing that you know. And I suspect there are some atheists who, I mean, this, this sounds a little strange, but um, as long as we're discussing permutations that have taken place, atheists who believe that there's a God up there somehow, but he just isn't, he isn't any traditional God because they haven't really heard very much about traditional gods that, and particularly haven't heard much that's defensible. That makes sense to them. Yeah. Oh, boy. You know what? Let me, let me just see if I can find it real quick because uh, I... Let's see. Well, uh, see if I can move this. No, I can't. Let me uh, take this out first so that I can get that out of the way. So, there, okay, now I'm going to try doing this. These days everybody's searching their phones. Oh, uh, that was the right one, there, there it is. There we are, okay, let's put this down. Open a new one, and then go to, um, and if we're, if we do it right, and let's search and see what we can While you're do. looking for that, I might just read the one in Romans. Here or it since is. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Yes. Although, you see, in that passage you can say, but they all turned away anyway. See, but, but there are passages where, it, it, further, that it says, uh, excuse, uh, sometimes excusing themselves. Well, if you go to look at it and around the world, which I find, is that uh, if you want to find a person who knows the attributes of God is how they treat their enemy. Mm-hmm. But first, here's our first text. and second commandment is like that, and it's impossible for a human to treat their enemy kindly. It must be from some higher power, even if they don't know what it is. Yeah. Here's Zechariah 13:6, and one shall say to him, "What are these wounds in thine hands?" Then he shall answer, "Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends." Now another version says, "What are these wounds on your chest?" It says, "Between your arms." Your well, hmm. Now that raises an interesting question, so let's settle that once and for all here. Uh, let's go back up to here, and we'll. Uh, Internet's wonderful. Go to the uh, Westminster Leningrad Codex. Oops, sorry. Um, 
That is Hebrew. Oh. Uh, it won't. That won't help no, me. No, just a minute. Just, just a minute. We got to do it this way. Zechariah. Thirteen. What was it? Two. Six. 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 Um. Well, here we are. And one shall say to him, "What are these wounds between vein?" Yadika. So, um, you could say between your arms, or you could say uh, in your arms, and you could, you could probably justify either translation. But interesting to know how else this phrase is used. Yeah. So, the answer is that, that both translations are kind of justified. Either way, it shows ignorance of what happened if this applies to Jesus. Right, right. Either way, it shows ignorance of what happened. And what it says is that Jesus gets to explain them. And, and Ellen White takes off on that, but the point of it is it's actually in the scripture. It's just uh, not quite as obvious as she would make it. But it implies that somehow, uh, these people made it without ever realizing exactly how it happened. And before we get too upset about that, think about this. How many of you know exactly how food is metabolized? Well, I probably know more than most, but I know for sure that I don't know all of it. And yet, how many of you eat and are nourished? A, f a few more. <laughs> how many would be willing to wait until they figure it out before they take a meal? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you would be rather thin before you got done, I think. Um, I think we've got somebody coming back there and, and Ariel. I was wondering how far down the road you want to push this metaphor of people not understanding the whole truth, etc. How about the slaves that will be as if they never were? Where is compassion? Well... Okay, the slaves who would be as if they never were were the ones who were brutalized until they were brutal themselves, if you're going to defend it. And basically God says they didn't know what was going on. <coughs> he's, he's not going to hold that against them. Yeah, I interpret that as the, as the capacity for choice uh, and free will. So if we really don't have free will, so because of genetic, you know, or environmental, or whatever. Yeah. If you have a three-year-old that's a total brat, do you really hold that kid responsible when his parents have turned him into one? Um, but anyway. Um, I'm completely satisfied that uh, there is sufficient scientific evidence to believe in God. Um, but that's my case, and I think other people think entirely differently. In fact, uh, there are some say, no, I, I believe the Bible by faith, and in fact, you call this subsequent class faith in science, which raises another question which we'll go into. But uh, I wonder if we're overlooking the work of the Holy Spirit here, uh, which we don't have good handle on or information on, but some of these folks that uh, may call themselves atheists and so on may have certain ideas uh, promoted to them. We're told the Holy Spirit will guide us in all truth. Uh, that uh, that factor may be
contributing to the equation here and that we ought to consider it? Well, I, I will say this. I'm, I'm going to leave uh, God the job of judging. If he wants me to look over his shoulder some other time, well, I'll be happy to look over his shoulder, but I will look over his shoulder in faith because I think he knows what he's doing. And frankly, I'm not sure that I would. But Paul said that we will judge him. So. Uh, we're, not doing well, we're not doing it now, and, and we need to be really careful about how we judge people. And uh, that's right. And, you, and if you do have to judge them, you want to judge them in the way that you would want to be judged right back because we are told that that will happen. Uh, and that is on the authority of Jesus. I think I myself and we have to be very careful on using all the statements of Ellen White, such as the one on slavery, because she also says that we have ideas and theology and things that are wrong and we're going to learn that we were wrong in our ideas. She says that about herself. And she uses the term we. So which implies that she, she had some too. Herself. Okay. Yes. We have a comment over here when you're done. Go ahead. Send it. Um I think we're getting into some difficult questions that it would be better for us to leave in the hands of God. I, I, I sense that when I look back, I cannot help but feel that I would have done better if I had trusted God more. Uh, and this has been my experience over and over and over again. That, that's my only regret. It's not the painful experiences I had that I regret. It's that I wish I had trusted God more. Why? Because I have found him to be much more trustworthy than uh, every other device that I have resorted to instead. Uh, I would agree with that. I will point out one other thing, and this is maybe something that uh, is not really widely known. Uh, as I understand it, the core of Zoroastrianism originated with Zoroaster. And the, there were two things that he said that stuck the, in particular. One of them is God does not have any shape. You cannot make an idol of God. Zoroastrians now, if they want to represent God, represent it with a flame, which has no shape to it. Um, I seem to recall a flame being yes, used, a bush, a bush <laughs> on top of the ark, um, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. You know, it does kind of remind you, doesn't it? The second thing I'm going to point out is that he pointed out that there was a supreme God, there was a good God underneath him and an evil God. In the end, the evil God will be destroyed. As I understand it, that kind of got lost with the passage of time to where Zoroastrians now kind of are resigned to the eternal struggle. But you can't really blame that on Zoroaster. And before we get all self-righteous about the Zoroastrians who perverted the truth, uh, we in Christianity haven't always been Simon Pure in that particular regard either. So, you know, cut them a little bit of slack. And that's why I put Zoroaster as my first list. I suspect that he, was, that he was in a very important way inspired. And I suspect that uh, the Magi didn't come out of the East for nothing. That there was actually a tradition that they were following that encouraged them to look for a young child who is to be born King of the Jews. But that's my thoughts. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the discussion. I'm very comfortable with it. 
but uh, I'm wondering if someone who was not a member of our faith would interpret us as believing that evidence for design leads to this detailed level of understanding God directly. I mean, design and designer are crucial foundational uh, positions that are well supported. But it's too easy for me to slip into the details of my belief using that as a foundation, which for many, including a, a lot of questioning advanced young people that I know very well, would bring up, hey, you know, can you take this stepwise? And my, my position would be it, the having a designer uh -huh. who's all wise, capable to do what we see, is consistent with the type of God we believe in, but that design doesn't lead to that inescapably. I agree with you. And uh, this is one of the interesting things. Douglas L. has done this marvelous job of pointing to seven things that modern science really can't argue very well with, uh, argue well at all with, frankly, and saying they point to a god. Now, in his last chapter, he is stepping back and basically saying, and what kind of a god do I see? And is, while there are places where I disagree with is him. Is even using the term god in place of designer. Right, uh, right. Support it. Right, exactly. But... Uh, uh, believe me, don't hear me saying I don't believe that yeah. they connect. Yeah, no. And, but and, logically... And, and so now what he is doing is saying, this is the kind of God I see. We'll hmm. get into some much more controversial stuff next week. <laughs> <laughs> you think this is... Can't wait. This is easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but but what I what I want you to say is see is that he is not content to leave it as yes there's a designer up there. Mm -hmm. He is he is willing to say and for me this connects with Abrahamic faith. And uh, he's going to say some very nice words about Muslims next week. Okay. Which. Frankly, this question about whether God has people in different areas that um, come by different roads to the same conclusion, if, I, if that's a fair way of putting it, um, is foundational to where he wants to take you next week. So I, I want to tell you that ahead of time. Uh, come in here. Okay. Come in here, come in here, and come in here. Going with the Romans talk about the personal responsibility <laughs> is that the Holy Spirit can give a revelation personally to a person. And we are to be witnesses. And if you're a witness, it's what happened to you, not what you can tell has happened to somebody else. Example, one of our programs near Monterey, the courier took the money down to the bank. And the banker asks, may I ask you a personal question? And the courier says, sure. He says, how much is it costing you to hire all those soldiers that are protecting your eye clinic that the community sees? There aren't any. They're angels. Now, that doesn't hold weight for the group, but it holds weight for the personal experience that we experience that know that there's a God a personal God there. I, I just want to point out, uh, once you open that door that there is a God, uh, you are almost in a different world. Now, uh, it's true that uh, most of the, a lot of the Christian community uh, compromises on that issue to a certain extent. Uh, in that they will say, well, yeah, there's a God, but the Bible, uh, that's allegory. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that uh, 
And Al referred to this a little bit, that if you have a, uh, a, crea a creator or something, and you're the result of that creation, and I mean, your science <laughs> tells you you, uh, you just couldn't have it written by chance. Uh, to produce people who can think, who can write, who can talk, and to not communicate with them if you're the god, uh, it makes less sense to me than to think, no, God must have communicated to us. And I look for that communication, and the Bible seems the most reasonable one. Uh, so I, I, that package makes more sense than to say, well, uh, there's a God, but I, I, I'm not going to believe the Bible. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me it's, it's more rational to think that. Now, I, I could be wrong. My, my reasoning often is wrong. But uh, uh, I find that path, at least right now, to me to be more reasonable than the alternative pass, path. And furthermore, I think that Zoroaster fits very nicely into the Bible, so now you've got two religions that basically agree. Anyway, comment here. Uh, can you pass the mic? Thanks. And the third religion that does as well is Islam. Uh, they believe that Isa is coming back to take us home. So there goes another religion. They are all Adventists, by the way, <laughs> because they believe Christ in is coming second. to take them home. Yes. Now, there's also text in Quran that says, worship on Sabbath, on Sabbath. They moved it to Friday because Friday was the gathering place where all the uh, market, was the market day. So people would come and say, hey, yeah, we are together, you know, let's also worship on this day. So there are folk right now, Muslims, who do worship. Their main worship day is Sabbath. Uh, yes, and I think that you can teach, uh, you can teach that Jesus is the only perfect man from the Quran, right. and you can teach that uh, that we need a savior in the judgment, and it doesn't take a lot of putting those together to have Jesus as your savior. And uh, in September, I'm going to be spending a lot of time with these folk in India and in Bangladesh, you know, and very educated people, university students, no problems quoting the scriptures with them, nothing, not at all. Yeah. So. I, I think there are people coming, come at it from various different directions, and as long as they're following where God's leading them, then uh, they are his sheep. Yeah, absolutely. They may not join us uh, in church. It does not matter. I am grateful to hear your comment just now. Uh, yes, you're quoting a passage, I think, from the Quran or from the Hadith that urges worship on Sabado? Yes. You're the first person I've heard in 25 years that has, that has confirmed what I heard before then from Dr. Ken Vine, professor of theology at La Sierra, who from his own study, uh, and he was for many years in the Middle East, he uh, he told me personally that there had been in Bangladesh yes. or in that territory not just a few but a size substantial community right. of Islamists who, who were promoting Sabado oh, as the day of worship. They have a chemical uh, company, pharmaceutical, Sabbath chemicals, <laughs> pharmaceutical, Sabbath <laughs> Pharmaceuticals. Uh, my dad, being a pastor, who of course was a Seventh Day Adventist pastor, would not touch. Uh, biggest thing is pig. You know, when they found out that my dad was uh, close to vegetarian, and uh, he would be worshiping with them in this huge, huge, huge mosque, but they would not let other Muslim mullahs go in there. Well, Very important. I thank you. I will 
talk to you later. Sure. I want to get documentation about sure. this very thing. Because I have had many years of close, close affiliation with Muslim believers. And uh, that's another issue. We are talking today about Douglas L. and what he has given us. And uh, well, I, I think th I'm, I'm glad that he brought up the subject because what it does is it takes Christianity out from being a cult. Yes. Into, and and you're, going to, you're going to look at me and say, what? Well, let me explain to you. Uh, there, there is a guy by the name of Walter Martin who wrote about cults. The kingdom of the cults. The of the cults and at one time, Adventism was in it. And then he talked to some Adventists and he decided, no, we didn't really belong. We have weird ideas, but we're not really a cult. Uh, one of the things that it was having an authority other than the Bible, one of them was uh, 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 having a belief that nobody outside of us would be saved. See? And of course, the Adventists have occasionally given that uh, that impression that we think that we're so much better than all other Christians that you know if you don't become an Adventist, why you're just hung. And uh, fortunately, our our um, uh, our uh, you know. Th most of our really good theologians are quite cognizant of the fact that uh, if you're going to take Ellen White, she says that there will be all kinds of people coming in, including Catholics, including you know, and she talks about the mission. The missionary comes in, and the and the pagan befriends the missionary before he has any idea of what the missionary has to say. If that uh, if that person dies before he hears the word of God that he is somehow worthy of being saved regardless um, because he has in his heart the, the, the advice of Jesus the, and the example of Jesus, even though he hasn't heard the, the name. Um, and I think that those are some of the places where you find some of these comments about John 10. Uh, another sheep have I which not... And, and so uh, we, we, if we're going to include people like Catholics or maybe even uh, pagans, or, you know, we cannot say that other Christians can't be part of this as well. We cannot afford to be exclusive with Protestants if we're not going to be exclusive with Catholics. Well, I read this book. And he goes through, I think, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and uh, if I remember right, it was Christian scientists. I may be wrong on that. And explains that each of these has a system, and it's a closed system, and nobody is saved except for the people who are in it. I don't know how accurate that is of Mormons. I'd be interested to know, because I have a feeling that they're not that exclusive. But... The th when I read the book through, then I read the appendix, and it said, well, you know, we haven't mentioned the biggest, the biggest cult of them all, the Catholic Church, because it has an extra-biblical authority, and it, you know, it's, he has like five criteria, and you go down them, and, and, and one of them is, and they believe that nobody will be saved but them. Well, you know, there was a time when that was true of the Catholic Church, that the, they didn't talk about separated brethren. They talked about people who were bound for hell. John and it suddenly dawned on me that what he was really doing, the reason that this was important is because, you see, if you're part of a cult, you can't be saved. <laughs> which means that Catholics can't be saved, which means that what he was doing was he was turning conservative Protestantism into a cult. Except for the Bible, which is our only authority, everything else fit. Because you see, there is no salvation outside of our circle. Yes, and you don't like that. Well, that's tough. You just, you just don't understand God. Um, 
And, and so, you know, it is really kind of a choice between looking at salvation as a, um, how shall I say it, a, a closed system and an open system. Doug L. has opted for the open system, and in my opinion, more power to him. Oh, well, we're off again on a tangent, but I wanted to just say how much I have appreciated your tenacity in staying with Douglas L. for ages. <laughs> I have seen your, your discussions advertised. Uh, Since my... the Mesozoic, at least. <laughs> <laughs> well, but he represents an important uh, evolution in, in the intelligent design movement. Before him, you already have given a lot of attention to Douglas Axe and his, his book, um, Undeniable. Which actually Both, uh, chronologically came after L. But all right, know. yes. Yeah. But at least in my attention, yeah. uh, L came more recently. <laughs> but until those two men came out of the woodwork, the intelligent design movement, including uh, their spokesmen like Stephen Meyer uh, and, and others, and, mm -hmm. have been reluctant to, to even use the word creation or, or suggest that we ought to inquire about the qualities we expect in a designer. They insist on design. You cannot have a design without a designer to explain it all. And these two men have done exactly what you say. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Axe, Axe used the word impossible, undeniable, mm -hmm. that chance could not produce all the magnificent complexities right. in our microbiology. And now, if, you, if you have a designer, it has to be a brilliant designer, it has to be a, a powerful designer, and the only real question is, if it, is it a good designer? And if the, you answer the, uh, yes to that question, you're talking about God. Well, yes. And now, with, with the seven pillars of scientific foundation for the existence of God, that's what Douglas L. starts to present. But, and he does so, so persuasively that it's, it's it's unanswerable, at least it seems so to me. Now It's undeniable, that's the phrase you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, w what it means to me is that intelligent design movement with this, with this stimulus had, had, have advanced a major step in taking an intelligent and serious look at the designer himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. to be more to be said about that. Right. But we, we no longer, as, as Loma Linda University, need to apologize to anybody for believing in the existence of God. We have undeniable evidence for that. Mm -hmm. And L gives that to us, or helps to, mm -hmm. helps to complete it. I agree. Thank you. The intelligent design movement is sometimes described as a modern invention to uh, deal with liberalism, atheism, and all the other isms that we have floating around. But 2,000 years ago, Apostle John opens his gospel, the fourth gospel. In the beginning was the word. Greek is logos. Right. Logos. And it's not confined just to something that you can speak. It's something that is connected to the mind. It's intelligence. And so I'm... Well, the, the, the word biology, yeah, geology... all the logos is... Theology. Theology, good. So I'm proposing that we use the word intelligence here in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the intelligence, and the intelligence was God. Now, I don't think we've wandered off of the topic of intelligent design with our discussion today because you can go down to verse 9 
speaking about the intelligence, being a light. Light comes into the world. And that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Think of that. Every man. Do we take that metaphorically? Everyone who happens to see the light, or is it everyone? <laughs> the, there's, there's somebody off in China somewhere, okay. or Native America. Yeah. I, I, the I, Philippines. I, one of the rules of hermeneutics is take something literally unless it's impossible to take it literally. Yeah. Well, I think it's very possible to take this literally. But here's where the rub is, and the point we have to keep reading in that chapter. And it says, and this word, or the intelligence, became flesh and dwelt among us. That is something that we can't learn from the natural world, right? The incarnation is not prefigured in flowers, planets, whatever. That comes from the living word, people having seen the living word and transmitted that uh, knowledge word of mouth and by print and so on to every man. And that's our job. That's our job, to speak about the living word, the living intelligence that was made flesh. Yeah. Big challenge. And, and I would go on further than that and say that if the living word is presented appropriately, fairly, that those who have had the word of God speak to them and they have responded will find a congenial fit. Yes. And so if the word is presented appropriately and somebody reject, rejects it, that says something about the person. Remember, the darkness has not overcome the light. But it does not mean that men hated the light. Men, men, it does not mean that men didn't hate the light because their deeds were evil and tried to avoid it. And so that brings us back to there is a great controversy. Zoroaster was right. Anyway, see you next week. We'll have more fun.